Gentlemen, I announce now here I have the privilege to chat with uh, Bobby Blitz as well. Uh, let's sing her for Overkill. Bobby, thanks for joining. How are you, mate? Oh, no, great to be here promoting the Scorch record. Looking forward to going on the road. Okay. Good to be back to normality. <laughs> okay, Bobby. Well, let's talk about the Scorch. You are going to release your brand new album on April the 14th uh, through Nuclear Blast Records. Uh, what can you tell me about, about this new record? You, you work remotely uh, for this new material, didn't you? Well, yes, it was, you know, the uh, when the world shut down in, in March of 2020, uh, we already had completed the demo. Uh, it was a skeletal version of it. So we had that period of time uh, to work on it, record it, redo it. The drums were done soon after there. The drums were done in 2020. But we had finished drums and scratch guitars and a whole demo to work on um, while the pandemic happened. So... You know, I'm not saying I, I could use a pandemic every five years, but I, I sure took advantage of that extra time uh, to, to make the record, I suppose, what it is, which is, uh, which is a little bit different from most Overkill records. And yeah. I'm uh, quite happy with the results. Yeah, for sure. And I can imagine all the pent-up energy that you, you had inside. I mean, this album uh, was recorded between the pandemic, so uh, ah, and it's the first one in five years. So I can imagine that that you were anxious to to release these new material. Can yeah, man, no, no doubt. I mean, it was it was the first in that amount of time. But again, yeah. as you asked earlier, it was also done remotely, so it was done quite differently for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, normally, we will work remotely in the modern era, but but we are spending time together. We're either on the road talking about the songs, recording in the back lounge of the bus. Yeah. I demoed an entire record on the road. So it means, you know, for me, I had my partner, Dee Dee. I had Dave Linsk. I had the drummer with me. I, I don't think it was uh, Jason at the time. I think it was Ron. Uh, but I had all of, you know, I had all these tools uh, while I was doing it. So it, it was unusual to be uh, to be remote. But with that being said, um, at such a depressing time uh, or insane time, uh, the pandemic, it became... Uh, it became a, a piece of sanity amongst the insanity. So mm -hmm. if it was a depressive type feel that I was adding to the record with my lyrics and my vocal lines, it gave me the opportunity to change it because of how much time that we had. We didn't want to release during the pandemic. We wanted to make sure that when we released, we could tour. And that's what we're going to accomplish with this. But those three years of writing for me, uh, I think really helped obtain the results we did uh, on Scorched, especially uh, vocally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Blitz, um, apart from the sound that characterizes the band, I, I feel that this album is a little a little bit more eclectic than the others. Uh, do you agree with me? For example, the song uh, Scorched itself has symphonic elements in, in the intro, for example. I think, it's a, I think it's a good choice of word, eclectic. I... Mm -hmm. I you know, each has a, a different personality. I, I think that when I started, you don't really understand the record when you're recording it or when you're writing it. I, to me, anyway, I don't. Um, but I understood it when it was done. And, and I eclectic would be the word, but it also had dynamics that, you know, that changed from one song to the next. I think the idea when a band like ourselves, who've been around close to 40 years, writing a record we don't want to write songs we want to write an entire record something that when you you know in the old days you'd put the needle down and you would stay there and listen to it you needed that you needed 50 minutes to hear your record um and i think that that's what this has because of all the eclectic values to it it becomes interesting from song to song to song and eventually becomes that whole 10 song record mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i was just thinking about for example fever and fever, you have uh, that eclectic system because it, it starts like uh, some kind of Indian Indian influences. So, what what about that song? Uh, what what can you say about that that tune? Yeah, that was a, that was a tough one for me at, at uh -huh. first. The, the heavy parts weren't tough. Uh, the blues riff in the center section wasn't tough. It was that mellow section that you're referring to on on the top. 
on the top mm-hmm. end of it. It's two sections. Um, and I had, I had wrote it a counter melody line to uh, to what Didi and Dave were playing in, in that part. And I, I must have wrote it 10 different times. I was just totally dissatisfied with it. Somewhere, out of nowhere, I just sat there and opened my voice up and opened my mouth, just like almost as if I was talking it with melody. And it seemed to be what was necessary. As star- instead of overthinking it and trying to make it super melodic, if Dee Dee and Dave are super melodic, I should be super melodic. And I say, that's mm-hmm. fucking bullshit. You know? I say, what does Ozzy Osbourne do when he gets in this situation? He opens his fucking mouth, he sings, and it sounds great. <laughs> so, you know, my feeling was, you know, am I channeling an inner uh, Osbourne? I don't know, but I, I, I simplified it. And I think by simplifying it, it actually became that dynamic we talked about in the last answer. It's one of my favorite songs on the record. Yeah, yeah, it's astonishing. Well, Bobby, uh, well, I'm a drummer, so I must ask you about Jason. I, I was really, uh, I I went mind blowing when I when I listened to the record because Jason uh, is very powerful, very aggressive. Uh, for example, uh, the song "The Sartian, uh was incredible. So uh, Jason has been in the band for a while. What can you say about him? Well, he adds, you know, he adds a new dimension to the band. If we're talking about dynamics, you know, Jason is, I mean, he's like the atomic clock. He knows what time it is all the time, yeah. every time. And that is what a drummer is, is about time, right? I mean, you know. Um, I think the excitement that he brings to it is his skill. Um, the consistency he brings to it is his time. Um And you also, with his talent, you can't, you know, you can't hold him back and say, oh, no, no, this is the way these drums have to be. Because he's thinking, we're not thinking as drummers, Didi and myself. I mean, maybe Didi more so, more so than I, because he'll do, he'll do, you know, guide drums with fingers on, uh, on the first demo. Mm-hmm. But you have to give it to someone like Jason, who has the drummer's mind. And you obviously know by listening to him and being a drummer that he's at, he has an outstanding sense of writing when it comes to, to his pieces. This is Jason. This isn't us telling Jason what he needs to do. It's mm-hmm. Jason saying, this is how I interpret this. So he brings, you know, he brings 20% of, let's say, positivity to this record because his input is his own, not, not us telling him what to do. Okay. Okay, Bobby. Well, uh, uh, regarding the tunes, Wicked Place, for for example, it, it, it's great. Uh, the intro remind me of Metallica's Am I Evil? And then the main group uh, turns to some kind of bluesy uh, feel. So what is this song about? What, what is this? What is it about? Well, it's obviously written in the pandemic, but it's, um, it's about recognizing yourself after... Uh, change or tragedy how do you you know how do you get to this place how did i get to this fucking place <laughs> i take it one step at a time that's really what you, I, I, <laughs> and, but i agree with you musically um I, i didn't think of the am i evil but when i you know when i first heard that riff i was saying oh i love this kind of shit because it's just that blues ride you know what i mean it, but it's an aggressive blues ride it's like taking yeah. it's like taking fog hat and taking Metallica, putting it in a blender, and then seeing what comes out. You know what I mean? And that's and that's kind of the cool vibe about a song like that. And then you add Jason's drums, and it makes it it makes it all metallic again. It's mm. the whole thing becomes metal, but it's all based on that blues ride. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, in March, uh, it will be 30 years since the release of I Hear Black. So will you be uh, playing some songs uh, from that album on this new tour? Shit, I didn't even I didn't even think that. I mean, I didn't even <laughs> 30 years, but you're right. Percy fucking years. Just, we, were going, we were going over the set the other day, and he goes, did we ever play I Hear Black Live? <laughs> <laughs> I think the first tour we did it. We did I Hear Black, we did Dreaming in Colombian, and we did Spiritual Void. And um, so we were, we're in the middle right now of whether we add it or not. But now that it's 30 years, maybe, maybe it gets snuck in there, you know. Okay, okay. Well, uh, on April 14, the tour starts together with Hida in Germany. So, any chance to see you guys in Finland? Jeez, I don't, not on this run. Um, 
this all has to happen in segments for us at, you know, at this point, um, you know, the world kind of changed with regard to, you know, recent history. And especially when it comes to the simple logistics of doing a tour, you know, it's, do I want to, of course, you know, I mean, this is what I do. I mean, this is what I love. And we actually at one point did an entire Finnish tour. We, I think we did five or six shows in, in Finland and it was, maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, but the logistics were different. And and I, I can bullshit with logistics, but it comes down very simply to finance. Yeah. Um, at this point in our lives, we're not paying to go anywhere. <laughs> that's, and and yeah. that's just smart enough to, that we can keep the business running. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. um, do I want to? Yes. Will we explore it? Of course we will. Because um, Scandinavia has always been good to us. I mean, it's not like overwhelming with regards to the amount of people, but much more than we ever uh, had thought in the past when we finally did a full Scandinavian tour about uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, Bobby, uh, you went through some health issues uh, um, over the years. So, what are you doing now? And apart from that, what lessons have you learned from these experiences? Somebody, somebody did that on one of the Zooms like this, right? And he goes... Well, you had that issue. You had that issue with your face on your nose, and I went, "What do you mean? What? what are you <laughs> yeah, that's the attitude, mate. Yeah, <laughs> uh, shit's, shit's okay. I mean, I stopped smoking. Um, I stopped smoking after the Electric Age, so that's that's ten years ago. Um, it, you know, I obviously still vape, as you see me doing it here, mm -hmm. but it's more of a it's more of a habit than it is a need. Uh, it's like a social pacifier for me. Um, I, I think I'm okay. I mean, I'm in my 60s at this point, you know, so shit could change like, like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, I still have my fun. I got my dog. I, I do walk. Um, I still stay thin enough. And, and I think singing um, and being on the road has always been uh, my fitness. It's just been one of those I've done other things, but if you can sing, you can keep your your lungs open, and yeah. it's uh, it's just it's just a great way to stay fit. And how do you prepare before touring? How many times do you usually rehearse, for example, with a band? Yeah, we rehearse. I remember I was sitting when I was married. I was sitting in an Irish pub, and I with uh, with my wife and and uh, two other couples, and you know it had gotten to about midnight. And uh, somebody said, hey, let's get some more beers. And I wasn't having the best time. I was thinking to myself, I can't wait to get the fuck out of here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I said to my wife, I, I, I look like at my phone like this. Oh, it's midnight. We better get going because I need I have to get to rehearsal tomorrow. And she said to me, who are you kidding? You haven't rehearsed in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome so i don't really prepare that much for it um I, but i always sing i mean i'm always singing around the house i'm always listening to tunes and singing them whether they're the you know the metal and hard rock of my youth um or whether they be uh the stuff we're working on so i am rehearsing uh just maybe not necessarily as hard as the other guys are okay okay bobby last two questions um you started overkill uh in the 80s so how did you remember the old days there in new jersey i mean it was exciting i mean you know you know who do you join a band when you're you know i, I guess i was in my 20s i was in college you, do you join a band because you have this great need you know to express your art i think some people do uh for me it was fucking cool it's just mm. that fucking simple. It was a cool thing to do. You met girls. Everybody gave you a free beer and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> you know, one day you're just this fucking schmuck, you know, some just this dickhead nobody cares about. The next fucking day after the gig, you're like, whoa, where do these guys come from? Mm -hmm. That's a funny story. I had to go, we finally get a record deal, right? It's it's 1984, and Megaforce Records reaches out. And I was in a university in, in Manhattan, in the city. And I was in my third year. And and uh, my father busted his chops to get me in there. And I had to tell him I had to drop out because I got to take this deal. I said, Dad, I got to take this deal. I said, you can't 
just let a record deal go by. They'll give it to somebody else. It won't be there when I get out. He was disappointed, right? He said to me, Bobby, are you sure this is not about girls and free beer, right? I said, no, it's about art. Well, anyway, 20 years later, uh, a, a big sports personality who likes the band gives me free tickets, 15 of them, for a baseball game on my father's 75th birthday, right? New oh, York Mets. Great. That's a metal, he's a metal head. His name is Mike Piazza, right? He was a, he was a big catcher See, yeah. in the Hall of Fame, everything, right? But he loves fucking overkill. And I would help him out with any benefits. So he gives me 15 tickets. And I'm sitting next to my father. He's having the time of his life with big baseball fans. He's got his arm around me and my brother, right? Like, <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> I go, uh, I go, Pop, I got to tell you something. 20 years ago, when I left the college, the university, it was about girls and free beer. <laughs> he goes, I know. <laughs> That's a very long answer to your question, but it was worth it, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, but we, uh, final one. Um, any advice for aspiring musicians? Well, it's a different world. I, I I don't know if I would know how to. Yeah, it. it's so different right now. I mean, we, we were, you know, we were lucky enough to be in the last phase of what was excess for the record companies when they had excessive profits. This is pre CD, pre digital. There was vinyl, there and there was cassette, and they were spending money on on bands, even bands like us. They were spending money, and it was one of the reasons we got traction to stay around. I think you need to reinvent yourself, though. I mean, we've had to, because um, all of that shit's changed. Um, but I think for a young band, I think you just have to keep writing and writing and get better and get better, but get better at a faster rate because it's a very, very crowded market. I mean, anyone can make a good record in their bedroom, in their basement. Anyone can put that YouTube video out. Anybody can get a great mix. Uh, so it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard time. I remember a guy asked me, you know, what, what would you tell, you know, the young band you were on tour with? I would say, I would say, you know, get the fuck out of my way because I'm not. <laughs> yeah. There's something to be said for that, that attitude. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what I would tell the young mm -hmm. band is to say, hey, get the fuck out of my way. I haven't started yet. You know, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Bobby, thank you very much for your time. Hope to see you back on the road with Overkill soon. And congrats for your brand new album, mate. Thank you, Hernan. See you. Bye-bye. Take care. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao.